Hey, I'd like to welcome you to another episode of the Mission Matters Innovation Podcast, your source for all things innovation. My name is Adam Torres. You can follow me on Instagram at Ask Adam Torres. Keep up with my book releases, book tour schedule, signings, all that other good stuff. Always love to connect with you there. And as always, if you'd like to apply to become a co-author of one of my upcoming books, just head on over to the website, missionmatters.com, and click on Become an Author to Apply. All right, so today is a very special um, episode. So I have a return guest, Chuck Barron, on the line, who has also um, just been published in our most recent edition of uh, the Business Leaders edition of Money Matters, um, which just, by the way, as of this recording, let's see, what is today? It's Thursday, uh, April 2nd, which just was released yesterday, April 1st, and uh, hit the number one new release on Amazon's hot new release section. Um, so Chuck, first off, uh, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Adam. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. So um, uh, congrats, number one. I'm honored to publish your work, and we're going to get into uh, your chapter in the, in the book, um, People Management, Key to Survival in a High-Growth Environment. I want to do a deep dive into that, but to the listeners, we're not going to give it all to you because we still want you to go out there and buy the book, of course, but we're going to give you a good, uh, a good amount of the content uh, so that you can benefit from Chuck's um, knowledge and writing. Um, but before we do that, Chuck, I do want to go a little bit, um, for, the, for the audience that didn't catch your first episode with me, I want to go a little bit more into your background. So tell me a little bit more about how you started uh, in business and, and as a tech executive. Yeah, yeah, sure. No problem. Thanks. So I graduated um, college in the early, early 90s with a Bachelor of Arts degree. And after a few years tooling around Chicago, I went back to school for an MBA. And that really kind of got me started in uh, on a career path in the world of business. I worked at McKinsey and Company in Chicago, and in the late 90s, like a lot of people, I got dot-com fever, and I left to join a startup company with a few students I had been recruiting, and um, that didn't work out. <laughs> but I sent an email to all my friends, and one of them was um, a McKinsey and Company friend who founded a new startup called Field Glass, and he hired me. And Field Glass was in the world of um, vendor management system. So really, another way to say it, online procurement for contingent labor. Well, I joined Field Glass in 2001 before we had any customers. Um, you know, I was a, clearly an early employee. And um, we were a pioneer, kind of, in the world of SaaS software. We were in the cloud before we called it cloud. and we were software as a service before that was term, and I implemented the product for a number of years, um, you know, our first customer and then many more, and we were very successful, and we became a leader in this small fledgling market, and Fieldglass was growing and growing, and um, around 2008 or so, after a number of years, we did a reorg because we had a number, a, a critical mass of people, and I became the director of the implementation group. You know, we maybe had 15 people. Um, implementing SaaS software was really different than traditional um, software implementations because we weren't an on-premise program and the, um, you know, it was all about efficiency and it was less about racking up bill rates uh, and hourly billable hours and more about implementing quickly and delivering value. So anyways, um, it was a fun thing because we were creating something from scratch and we were pretty successful in focusing on efficiency and continue to grow and continue to be a market leader. And ultimately, um, we were growing too fast to keep up. And I had my team of maybe 20 people had too much work, not enough people to do it, and we couldn't hire fast enough. Um, but around that time, 2010, um, we were acquired by a private equity firm, which injected a lot of capital into field glass and really gave us direction to scale the business, grow a, um, a larger self-sustaining business, stop worrying about every transaction and um, build something special. And, and so we were able to hire a lot of people. Um, I, was, I had created um, teams of, um, uh, with team leaders to try and help each other uh, through the pain, I guess we call it. But mm -hmm. it didn't really work out because those team leaders also were engaged with their project work and didn't have time to support their people. But this injection of new people allowed me to transition those team leaders out of their project work and into traditional management roles. 
And um, after we transitioned that out and created that management layer, we had to figure out how to be good managers. And so we got into training of um, management, and that's where I personally really found my passion for um, you know what I was really loved to do, and it, it turns out I was very interested in uh, leadership principles, people management routines, and um, I really dove into the learning. Uh, listened to a lot of podcasts, read a lot of books, took online training courses, and tried to um, tried to adopt most everything I could learn and bring to my company and my department, and um, it was great fun. And, you know, without going into a, a ton more details about what that looks like, I can mm-hmm. tell you that after a year, we were quite successful. Um, to turn the department around. The employees uh, liked their job again. They were fully engaged. We were doing more work of better quality and really convinced me that this people management is how to create a place where great people want to stay and how to recruit and attract top performers. And um, and you know, so it was a lot of fun. Um, Man, I tell career. you, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. I, no, it's it's great. And the thing is, and one of the things that I got out of your chapter and was that, uh, and I, I tell people this all the time, and I swear I don't know if they believe me or not, but I always have to give more and more examples. And what I saw of what, like, the difference between in, in growth as a leader and, and what the, even the ejection of capital just allowed Field Glass to do Um, and how it allowed you to have the resources to be able to um, implement the training. And we're going to – I'm going to pull out a couple things from the chapter and have you elaborate on them, but all these different things that you showed, I mean, you – and just telling you, Chuck, like you changed my thought process on my business because I've I've been very – hesitant to take on outside capital or VC or things like that because people just because of um, we're a small team of eight I mean we're not huge but we put out a lot of content we put out we, we work really hard so I never really and I'm always thinking about you know there's pros and cons of doing things like that but in looking at what you were able to do there it finally like the light clicked off in my head to where I was like oh like you're providing more opportunity, you're scaling, you're doing things in the right way, you're not worried about every transaction, You're, I mean just a lot of these things that happen I'm like I'm not saying I'm going to do it, but I'm just saying that now I'm now now it's part of the overall business plan as a potential as we grow to not like before I was totally closed off. Just to be honest, I was closed off. Somebody offered and they're like, oh, I'm like, no, I don't want it. No, I'm no, no, thank you. We're fine. We're good. And but now I'm like, man, I never I didn't even think about it. So reading your chapter, then this is just me telling you this. Every everybody yeah. else just happens to be listening right now on the podcast. I'm just telling you. <laughs> but that being said, um, I want to go into one or two things that I just noticed on my end I'm like I'm like man that that is a reason to do some things and I was like so I want to pull out a couple of these so first one um, and one of your one of your lessons or one of your um, subjects here was giving management time to manage um, talk, yeah. tell me a little bit more about what that meant to you yeah well so this is so the, the lesson was I created you know pseudo people managers when I had these team leaders but they mm-hmm. were still doing frontline work along with their teams and because we had so much work, you know, which is a great problem to have, um, yeah. but because we had so much work, they were putting all their time to their project work and their customers, and it didn't do anything for the teams that they were supposed to be managing. So those people still were unsupported. And so, you know, giving management time to manage, that really means to me is take other things off their plate because if you have good people managers with the time to do the right things for their teams, you're going to get a lot more out of the people, and those people will love working for you. And, you know, you know you've know, probably heard every, a lot of people say that when people leave, they don't leave their job, they leave their manager. For and, sure. Uh, that's, yeah, so that's really what that, that means. And, you know, I, in my chapter, you know, I call it, a, I, I refer to a high growth environment, and Field Glass was mm-hmm. that, but these concepts do apply to any company where you want to attract and retain top uh, top people. It's just easier when you're growing and you have mm-hmm. the money to spend on some of these things. For sure, 100%. And then, and then the next point that you make, which, you know, if uh, it, it, sometimes it's viewed as a luxury, but then it's like, ah, it's like that chicken or the egg thing or whatever, however that scenario goes, the embrace training. So you talk about embracing training in your chapter. Um, tell us a little bit more about that and what it meant to the growth. Yeah. Well, you know, I think that's I, th- I, I, I think that's particularly important 
for new people managers, you know, mm-hmm. because um, it, it's difficult to do it well. And it's really a skill set, but it's not enough to just have the skills to... Um, you're not born with it. Put it this way. You're not born yeah. with it. I try to you're tell people this. There's no, when you say you're a natural, if, you say, if somebody tells me they're a natural born like me, leader, okay, that means people follow you. If you tell me you're a natural born manager, I'm like, mm, I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of these concepts and a lot of things that good managers do are common sense, but it's mm-hmm. one of those things that it's common sense, but you don't know about it unless someone tells you about it, unless yep. you read about it. But once you get it, then, ah, that makes sense. Um, But, you know, there are people who are in these positions who are not all in. They don't, um, they're not passionate about it. They don't buy into all these rules and concepts. And so um, they don't, they're not disciplined about how to be a good manager, and they're not as successful. So it takes an interest and um, a skill set, but uh, in addition to the training, but if you don't embrace this training, you'll have a lot of great people who might be, um, you know, might be inspiring in lots of ways, and people might like them personally, but um, it's on the margins when you have a real difficult situation or you have to get people over a hump um, yeah. when the training and the and these uh, common sense things that you have to learn, you know, really come in handy. And I think on your end, what was really cool about your chapter and just kind of made sense and in your person, your experience as an executive was that because you were in this high growth environment, what you're talking about, so some people right now are listening to this and they're probably thinking, oh yeah, we've heard some of that, we've heard that, yeah, yeah. But here's the thing, what Chuck is talking about, he actually backs up with the numbers. So what I mean by that is he had multiple departments, multiple managers, multiple people working under him, and they're in this high growth environment, so he could see empirical evidence of the managers that were bought in, doing well, and what that looked like over time, and their numbers increased versus the people that were kind of like, ah, eh, just lip service or you know what I mean they're kind of bought in but not really and you can tell and over time those numbers kind of um, there was a there was a gap in those numbers and performance to where it became obvious can you talk a little bit more about that please yeah sure I mean simply put you know um, my managers and I um, one of one of the things we did is we reviewed our people regularly so we understood who um, who was dealing with what who where people ranked we wanted to make sure our most strategically important accounts had our top performers on them. And over time, we, it was very clear who was the top performers and who were the, you know, the weaker ones. And as the leader of the group, I also could tell, it, it kind of became obvious, that the poor performers all reported to the few managers who were not totally bought in and weren't very disciplined about these routines that we tried to implement as people managers. So they paid lip service to it, they embraced some things, they didn't do other things, but it really had an impact on the development and productivity of their team. And so, you know, that just reinforced my belief that this works. Not just, you know, not just the successes we saw, but how the failures kind of manifested themselves. Yeah. Man, so I love I it. Believe it. Yeah. Awesome stuff, Chuck. Um, so that being said, um, I, I could I could talk to you about the chapter all day, but we want people to go out and buy the book. So go out and buy the book, and there'll be a link in the show notes, of course. Um, and that being said, seriously, um, Chuck, if somebody's listening to this and they want more information or to connect with you and learn more about the projects you're working on, I mean, what's the best way for them to reach out? Yeah, you, you, the best way is find me on LinkedIn. I've got a lot of followers. I'm on every day, and I'd be happy to connect and meet you. Fantastic. Well, hey, Chuck, um, congratulations again on, uh, on on hitting that number one rank, number one, and it was an honor to publish your work. Again, I learned a lot from it, and I'm going to use some of that knowledge in building my business. I um, hope a lot of the readers and the listeners of this podcast will do the same. And to the audience, as always, thank you for tuning in. Hope you got a lot of value out of this. If you did, don't forget, subscribe to the podcast. Leave me a review on the Apple iTunes Store. If you're watching this on our YouTube channel, Mission Matters Innovation, give us a subscribe there. Um, And don't forget, leave some comments on that video. Let's not let the conversation end here. Let's keep it going. Let's move it on over to the YouTube community. And uh, Chuck, thanks again for coming back on the show, and uh, congrats again.